Well, good morning, Northside, and a happy new year, right, uh, is upon us today. Hey, uh, if you have someone in your life that you would say is trustworthy, someone who has proven faithful, it could be a parent, it could be a grandparent, it could be maybe someone you're in relationship with, a, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, maybe for you uh, it's a spouse. If you have someone in your life that you would say they have proven themselves, there's a track record there of faithfulness uh, where you would entrust your life to them, I want you just to raise your hand for a minute. If you got somebody, you would say, man, I trust them. And I, so that, that's, I mean, a lot of you in this room. And I want you just to think for a moment, how long did it take for, for that trust to be established? How long did it take? Maybe for some of you, it was a matter of months. And because of certain circumstances that happened, you were just like, man, I, I would entrust my life to that person because they came through for me. Maybe for others of you, it, it, it took a year before you said, maybe for some of you, I do. And, and you entrusted your life to them. You know, my wife and I, we've been married for 23 and a half years. And certainly, yeah, hey, let's celebrate that, right? 23 and a half years. Woo! Uh, man, 23 and a half years uh, certainly of her faithfulness is a proven track record that says, man, I, I would entrust my life, I do entrust my life to her. Uh, but I've done funerals of people who, uh, they had been married, and they're leaving behind a spouse, and they've been married for 75 plus years, you know, and, and you look at, at those kinds of relationships, and you're saying, man, there is a track record of faithfulness there of 75 years, you know, of, of someone proving themselves faithful and trustworthy that for us, I mean, that's about as much as it gets, you know, right there. But uh, what if I were to say to you today that I could demonstrate to you someone who has been faithful to you, who, who has been trustworthy for you for 3,000 years? You know, if, if 75 years for us, which is about as tops as it gets, uh, we, we'd be like, man, they're, they're trustworthy. Well, then certainly someone who has proved themselves faithful has a track record of faithfulness of 3,000 years, we would go, okay, I can entrust my life to that. I, I, I can believe and trust him for that. And, and the reason I want to talk about that today is because I've got a little timeline over here. I got this board and uh, that demonstrates what I'm talking about because it was 3,000 years ago. You know, we got 2,000 years from you to Jesus we have another thousand years from Jesus to David. And what I'm saying today is that 3,000 years ago, a promise was made to David. A 3,000 year old promise that was made to David that has proven true. If you're to look at this timeline, you got creation, you got thousands of years until you get to David. From David, you got a thousand years until you get to Jesus. From Jesus, we got 2,000 years to get to you. Another way to think about this, I don't have him on the board, but if we put Abraham right here, you would have from Abraham 1,000 years to David. So from the start of Israel as a nation with Father Abraham, from Abraham you have 1,000 years to David, and from David to Jesus you have another 1,000 years, which means right in the middle of the history of Israel as a nation for their primary purpose to bring Jesus, the Messiah, to the world, right in the middle, smack dab in the middle of their history, you have a promise coming to David, a promise that God is going to keep. And, and I want to I share with you this promise. It's found in 2 Samuel. In fact, if you, if you have a Bible or device, I want you to open up to 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we're going to begin reading in verse 12. And right here in this text... A promise God makes to David. And I want us to, to listen to this because it is going to establish for us the foundation of a 3,000 year, years of faithfulness of God. And, and this is the promise that was made. God said, when your days are over, David, and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. Now, to get some context here, God is telling David, you're not going to build the temple. Solomon is going to build the temple. 
He's going to build a house for my name. But all of a sudden, we're going to see God begin to make this promise reveal that, that he's actually going to establish a house through his line forever. So Solomon will build the temple, not David. But he says, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. David, the one who sits on your throne, yeah, that throne of that kingdom is going to be established forever. I will be his father. He will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with flogging inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Forever. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. And so what we have is David receives this promise from God that your throne is going to be established forever. And David believes him. Because David already has a little bit of a track record with God proving faithful to him. And he believes him for this big promise. And we know that because David goes on to actually say in uh, 2 Samuel uh, in, in chapter uh, 7, beginning of verse 27, we get David's response. He says, Lord Almighty, God of Israel, you have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build a house for you, so your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Sovereign Lord, you are God. Your covenant is trustworthy, and you have promised these good things to your servant. Now be pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue forever in your sight. For you, sovereign Lord, have spoken, and with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. David believes what God says. The promise was made to David 3,000 years ago that, that there would be one to come who would reign forever, that on his throne this kingdom would be established. That was the promise to David. But here's what I want you to know today is that if you think that promise to David made 3,000 years ago was more for David than it was for you, then you've missed it. Now, I know this is almost going to sound egocentric to you for a minute, that somehow that promise is really about you, but I'm actually stating Scripture. I'm, I'm going to read it in just a minute. But that promise given to David really was intended more for you than it ever was even for David. Now, what do I mean by that? What am I saying? Because God told David, you're going to be savage forever. So why am I saying that this is really more for you than for him? Well, here's why I'm saying this. Romans chapter 15, verse 4, I'm going to give you several scriptures here, says that everything that was written in the past was written to teach who? Us. So that we might have hope. Everything that was written in the past, it was written to teach us. 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. The prophets searched intently, trying to figure out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ. So all of those prophets who lived hundreds of years before, even on our board over there, you're going to see Isaiah, uh, who lived about 700 years before Jesus, so he's a couple hundred after David. Even Isaiah is making prophecies. And the prophets knew that God was revealing to them things about Jesus and about his sufferings and about his coming. They knew this. And even they were searching intently trying to figure out what it all meant. They didn't know. They didn't have the big picture. All they had was this this little view. And they were searching and trying to understand it. And what does this mean? And how is this going to play out? And, And when will it happen? And what will it be like? They didn't know. And so it tells us, uh, that they were searching until they figure this out, but, and the glories that would follow, but it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves when they received these prophecies, but they were serving who? You. They were serving you. Paul is writing this to New Testament believers. These prophecies, they were serving you. Why were these prophecies given? They're really given for you, so that you would have hope, so that you would understand, so that you would know. So that you could believe in who Jesus is. This is why they were given. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 10 says, The Old Testament law was written for who? For them? Or for who? You. It was for us. It was written for us. God gave us those prophecies so that we might believe. He gave us those scriptures. 
And those promises 3,000 years ago, that promise 3,000 years ago was was not fulfilled for 1,000 years. But it was given to teach us. David had no idea how it was all going to play out. He had no idea. But we have this unbelievable privilege, you and I do, of being able to look back at all of those years of faithful promises coming true. You know more about the fulfillment of that prophecy than David ever knew. God was revealing to him things, but he didn't have the big picture that you have. Because standing at this point in history, looking back, we have an incredible vantage point. So when, if we were to go back to this timeline real quick, if you look at creation, a thousand years later we, we have David, a thousand years later we have Jesus, two thousand years later we have you looking at this perspective. Right here in, in about two to three hundred years after David, seven hundred years before Jesus, we have Isaiah, the prophet. Um, and, and I'm just going to read to you right now from Isaiah chapter 9. This will be a very familiar Christmas text to you. 700 years before Jesus, the promise, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Next, let's keep going there. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah is saying there's a king, and he's going to come reign on the throne. Who is this king? Well, this king is Jesus. That's who this king is. Jesus is the king that God has promised. He is the fulfillment of this prophecy. And whenever you look at Jesus coming... In his birth, you see this coming to light. For example, magi from the east, they came seeking the king of the Jews. Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. We know that Nathanael, when Jesus called on him to follow him, one of the disciples, he said to Jesus, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. When Jesus made his way into Jerusalem, Matthew chapter 21, which was a fulfillment of prophecy from Zechariah 9.9, He said, behold, your king is coming to you, riding on a donkey. That was a prophecy about Jesus. Jesus fulfilled it. Your king is coming to you. And then we have this. When Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Before his crucifixion, Jesus said, yes, it is as you say. He is a king then. He is a king. The crowds on Palm Sunday... When Jesus came riding on that donkey, they said this, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. Jesus is the king. He's the promised Messiah who would sit on that throne, who would reign forever, who was establishing a kingdom. He is the king. He's the fulfillment of the prophecy. And if you have ever heard someone say, and I have multiple times, someone say, man, I just wish I lived back then, you know? If you were there when God parted the Red Sea, then man, you'd be like, I believe in God, you know. That'd be easy to believe. Man, if I were there when Jesus was born, and, or if I was a shepherd and the angels came to me and said, a Savior's been born to you, man, it'd be easy to believe in Jesus. If I got a direct word from God, a promise like David did, that, hey, he's going to reign on your throne forever, man, it'd be easy to believe in God. And I just want to debunk that myth for a minute. I want to debunk the myth. So I want you to look at this board for a minute. Here's what what I want you to notice. I want you to notice that there's some knot holes in the board. We got some knot holes in the board. And the reason we got some knot holes in the board is because every one of these people who lived, David, Isaiah, Mary, Joseph, at the time of Jesus, all they had to look through was what was right in front of them. And so if you lived during the time of David, all David could see was right here. This is all David could see. Was that right there? He couldn't see anything else. All he could see was right, what was right in front of him. And God gave David that incredible privilege to say, hey, David, I, I want to tell you something that's going to come. There's going to be one that comes. He gets this little sneak peek right here at what's going to happen right here. But still, he's just looking through a little knot hole of what's going to happen, that, that there's going to be this king, and he's going to reign forever on your throne, forever establishing his kingdom. 
And then David has to live right here. This is all he gets to see. He just has this little knot hole he's looking through. He doesn't know how it's going to play out, what it's going to mean. We fast forward about two or 300 years, we get to Isaiah. And Isaiah gets to look at what's going on around him. And Isaiah looks at what's happening around him, around him, about 700 B.C. He doesn't have the whole picture. And God gives him a little glimpse. The government's going to be on his shoulders. And, and this son right here is going to reign on David's throne. Wow, look at that. What would you look at that? And Isaiah gets a little sneak peek at who Jesus is and what he's going to do. And as he looks at this little knot hole of what's happening, he doesn't understand how it's all going to play out. He doesn't even know when it's going to play out. Because he can't see it from back here behind the board. It's on the front of the board. He can't see that. He doesn't know the timeline. He doesn't know every detail. And he's wondering how it's all going to play out, searching intently. And he comes back here and he tells everybody, hey, guess what I saw? Guess what God revealed to me? That a son will be born to you. And he will reign on David's throne. But this is all he had to look through. And then Jesus came and Joseph and Mary and wise men came and shepherds. And they got to celebrate Jesus from this place right here. But this is all they had. They didn't know how it was going to play out. Mary pondered these things in her heart. She didn't know all the details of the story. And when you look at these people, sometimes we want to say, man, they had the advantage. They had the advantage. No, they didn't have the advantage. They didn't have the advantage at all. So who has the advantage? I'll tell you who has the advantage. You do right here. This is us. We got the advantage. We don't have we got no knot hole. We're looking back at 3,000 years of history. When God made a promise to David, yeah, right here, let me scoot right there. That's me, right here. 3,000 years of history. He made a promise to David, and we've seen how it played out. Isaiah makes the same promise, who reigned on the throne. He comes, and the angels announce Jesus. The Savior will be born to you, and he will reign to Mary. He will reign on his father's throne, the throne of David, forever. And we see the promises fulfilled. We have the advantage. To look at thousands of years of God's faithfulness proving himself to be true. And if you have that kind of track record, don't you think we can trust what God says about the future? Don't you think if you have that kind of a track record, you say, man, that's somebody I can entrust my life to, who's proven himself over and over again? So I want us, I want us to look at that together at this track record of our God. You know, in the Christmas story, I love this character. If you want to look at this, it's in Luke 2, uh, verse 25. But I love the, the character of Simeon uh, because Simeon is that, uh, that righteous, devout man who appears to be a priest, and, um, which means one of his functions or roles, it seems, at the temple would be to, to consecrate children who are brought there at 40 days of age to the Lord. And at some point, it had been revealed to Simeon that he would see the Messiah before he died. He would be introduced to Jesus before he died. And maybe he knew that this Messiah was coming as a baby born to you. I mean, the prophecies would reveal this. I can only imagine that every child that he held as he consecrated this child to the Lord, he must have Wonder, you know, is this going to be the one? Is this going to be the one? But when Jesus was brought to the temple, the scriptures reveal that it was revealed to Simeon that this is the Messiah. This is, this is Jesus. And Simeon prays a prayer to God as he holds Jesus in his arms. And Simeon says in Luke 2, 29 and 30, he says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised... God didn't just make a promise to David. He didn't just make a promise to Isaiah. He didn't just make a promise to Joseph and Mary. God made a promise to Simeon. Sovereign Lord, as you've promised, my eyes have seen your salvation. God, you came through just as you promised you would. God keeps his promises. You know, we have a hard time keeping ours. Some of you may be working on some New Year's resolutions for 2018. And you're making yourself some promises. Maybe you're making some others some promises. We have a hard time even fulfilling New Year's resolutions. We all know that. We struggle with it. But if, if we're willing to entrust ourselves to people who sometimes don't keep some of the 
commitments or some of those promises that they're making? How much more should we entrust our lives to one who has been faithful and improved himself time and time again and has never broken a promise? God keeps his promises. He delivers. And so the question I'm asking today is, so how does this story relate to you? How does what I'm describing today really relate to you? Well, Peter answers this question after Jesus dies, is resurrected, ascends back to heaven. Peter's preaching that first sermon on the day of Pentecost. And here's what Peter says to all those Israelites that were gathered there at Pentecost. This is in Acts 2, beginning of verse 29. He says, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died. David, a thousand years ago, David, he died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne, seeing what was to come. He spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life, and we're all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he's received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord, King, God, and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So here we have Peter on the day of Pentecost saying the, the, the fulfillment of the promise has happened. Jesus is the king, the one that, that was promised to David. He is already establishing his kingdom. He is on his throne. He is Lord. He is God. He is the Messiah. That's what it's telling us, that Jesus is that king. And here's what I want you to know today. Here's how it applies to you. Jesus doesn't just want to be a king. He wants to be your king. He wants to be your king. Not just a king, but your king. You see, the reason the promise of 2 Samuel chapter 7 was written is so that you would call on Jesus to be the Lord and the King of your life. And so what I want to do is I want to give you three statements today followed by three questions. Okay? So here's the first statement. Jesus is the promised King. That's a fact. Jesus is the promised King. The question is, have you received him as your King? Is Jesus your King? Is he yours? Because the biggest obstacle to Jesus becoming your king is you. It's you. You want to be on the throne. You want to be in control. You want to call the shots. You want to serve yourself, please yourself. But Peter says, Jesus is Lord. That means he's king. He's ruler. He's boss. He's God. Not me. I always want to play musical chairs with God. And Peter says, we don't got no time for that. You have to make him your king. Peter says, believe that he's Lord Christ. Repent. Turn from your sins and turn to God. That's what making him king of your life means. is to give your heart and your life back to him. Peter says to be baptized into Christ, where you you die to that old self and you're raised to a new life with Jesus as that king of your life. You see, for Jesus to be the king of your life, there must be a moment of surrender. Surrender to his lordship. Surrender to his kingship. When you put him on the throne of your heart, the throne of your life, where you trust and believe in him, And the reason for that is because only Jesus 
in his kingdom can raise dead things to life again. Only in God's kingdom does that happen. If so, when Jesus is your king, that means you're in a kingdom where he takes that which was dead in sin and he makes it alive again. When Jesus is your king, he takes people who are dead spiritually and he breathes new life into them again. And people who have experienced that resurrection can then have confidence that he will raise them physically from the dead when he comes again and gives them a new body. And so my goal is just to encourage you, first of all, to make sure that that Jesus is your king because your salvation depends on it. If he's not your king, then you're not in his kingdom. And what I'm thinking today is, wow, if David would believe with just the little evidence that he had, Nathan the prophet coming and giving David this word. If David would believe that promise, just with the little information he had, looking through the little view he had, how much more should we, in looking through all of those years of history, be able to say, I should put my faith and my trust in Jesus. He has proven faithful. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore God exalted him, talking about Jesus, to the highest place, and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every tongue confess, in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess, acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What is an appropriate response to Jesus? It is to humbly come before him. In reverence to bow before him. That is the honor a king deserves in our life. That he has that place of reverence and honor. And we bow our knee to him. To his lordship. That's how you come into a king's presence. Humbly. Reverence. I remember it was September 11th, 1992. I was in my junior year at Missouri Southern State College when President Bush Sr. was running for a re-election. And he came to the campus of Missouri Southern. He was giving a speech. And all of my family went because we wanted to see the president. It was a big deal. And I remember we went out onto this lawn area and he was going to be speaking. Then he was going to be walking down and shaking hands. And there was this big fence, you know, through there. And uh, so we got as close as we could get and we weren't quite up to the fence. We were maybe a cut several rows deep. But my, my little brother, Rick, he's the youngest of, we call him Ricky, he was the youngest of us boys. Uh, he was about 12, looked like he was 8. And uh, he kind of snaked his way up to the front fence. He really wanted to meet the president. And he was so excited that President Bush was going to be there. And so he was at the front. Well, sure enough, when the president got done speaking, he came shaking hands. And when he got down to the very front, he shook Ricky's hand right there along the fence. And he got to shake the hand of the president, which was awesome. And then he reached beyond Ricky because he was only about that tall. And he began to shake the hands of the people behind Ricky. Well, Ricky, mesmerized to have the president right there, just reached up and grabbed his tie just grabbed his tie right there. And when he did that, you know, immediately President Bush looked down, he was like, whoops. And then a, quickly, a Secret Service agent slapped his hand away. And be, fortunately for Ricky, because he looked like he was eight, he just got a hand slap and not handcuffs. And so anyway, <laughs> President Bush kept making his way down the line. But Ricky later said, you know, I just wanted to reach out and touch him. You know, I, just, I just wanted to, to grab him. So it was so mesmerized by the President, you know, of the United States of America. And uh, you just don't do that. You don't grab the president's tie because that's not, that's not how you come into the presence of someone who's, you know, powerful and, and significant in that, in that office. And, and if we would show some type of reverence in that way, how much more should we show a reverence for God that, that we come before him humbly, knees bowed? Jesus Christ is the king. Is he the Lord, the king, the king of your life? Is, is he the Lord of your heart? Has he, has he, is he held in the highest regard in your life over and above everything else? King of kings, Lord of lords. And just know this, this king, creator God of everything, who sustains everything in this world, he will not force his way into your life. He doesn't come forcefully. Revelation says that that Jesus stands at the door 
that stands at the door of your heart, and he just smashes it down. No, it doesn't say that. If you know the text, he stands at the door of your life, and what's he do? He knocks, waiting for an invitation to let him in. He doesn't forcefully make his way into your heart. He's waiting to be invited. For Jesus to be the king of your life, there has to be this moment of surrender where you invite him in. But then there also must be a practice of surrender where you continually make him the king of your life. Maybe you remember back in the period of the judges, Judges chapter 17 and Judges chapter 21, it tells us that in those days, Israel had no king. That's what the text says. In those days, Israel had no king. You know why they didn't have a king? Because God was their king, and they were rejecting him as God. The text goes on to say everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's how they lived. I'm going to do whatever I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. I'm going to live for me. And so, God, you're not on the throne of our life anymore. Instead, we want a substitute. We, we want our own king. We don't want you. That's how the people were living during the period of the judges. They were not living daily for their king. There was no practice of surrender in their life to God, which tells us that once you make Jesus king, then you have to live for that king. So here's the statement. Jesus came to establish his kingdom forever. And the question is, are you living for his kingdom? Are you living for his kingdom? Because when you read in the book of Revelation about king kinds of things like thrones, for example, thrones that kings sit on. In the book of Revelation, every time it's talking about the throne of God, guess where that throne is found? It's found in heaven. And every time God talks about a throne and it's the throne of Satan, guess where it is? It's on earth. Thrones in the book of Revelation reveal that there are two competing kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Which realm are you living for? Because it's a choice between one or the other. Those are the only kingdoms that exist. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of Satan? The throne in heaven, are we living for that king? Or the throne on earth, are we living for the things of this world? Jesus came to establish his kingdom forever. Are you living for his kingdom? And finally, the third question is this, and final question. Jesus came the first time as promised. And so the question is, are you ready for his second coming as promised? It, it, Jesus came the first time just as he promised he would. That promise to David fulfilled. And now the question is, if God has proven himself faithful a first time, wouldn't it make sense for us to trust that he will be faithful a second time? The Bible says that we prepare for his second coming through holy living. 2 Peter 3.11 Peter says, since the end is near, what kind of people ought you to be? And it says you ought to live holy and godly lives. That the way you prepare for the second coming is by living a holy and godly life. Peter goes on to say in 2 Peter 3, 13, he says, but in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Look, we have another promise. that We're, we're going to have a new home. That there is a heaven and this is not it. <laughs> That Jesus is coming back a second time. Are you ready? Because he's coming. 3,000 years of faithful keeping of promises reveals to me that we ought to believe this one, that he's coming again. And so the question, the statements are, Jesus is a promised king. And the question is, have you made him your king? The statement is that Jesus came to establish his kingdom forever. And the question is, are you living for, the, for that kingdom? The statement is, he came the first time as promised. Are you trusting him that he's coming a second time as promised? And my prayer today, on this final day, December 31st of 2017, is that, you know what? Let's look back. Let's look, it's appropriate to look back at the past year of God's faithfulness, but I'm inviting you to look back 3,000 years of God's faithfulness. Because when we look back, it gives us the perspective to look forward. And what we have in looking back is a God who kept his promise. Jesus was born to us. And Jesus went to a cross for us. And he paid a price for us with his own body and his own blood. 
When you partake of emblems like we will in a moment as we take communion. In fact, if you're serving communion today, if you would uh, be dismissed, that would be helpful to us. But as you take bread representing the body of Jesus, it's a look back at a broken body on a cross 2,000 years ago. When you take a cup representing the blood of Jesus, it's a look back at blood that was shed for you on a cross which was the fulfillment of a promise that his body would be broken and that blood would be shed so that we could have forgiveness of sins. God was faithful to come and to offer his life. Communion really is that moment of not just looking back and remembering, but it's also that opportunity to say, I'm trusting in it right now. And I'm going to trust in this sacrifice for the future. That if God would bring me all the way from death to life, then I can trust him to take me from life to glory. He's faithful. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you, God, that you are faithful and trustworthy and that you keep your promises. And as we partake of communion right now, all who have put their faith and their trust in you as they participate in this. Lord, may we remember the sacrifice. And may it remind us right now of your faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us?